Hello, welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review of What We Left Behind, uh, which is a documentary about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, so this uh, video will be completely full of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the documentary What We Left Behind, I recommend that you go see it first before watching this video. But uh, if you haven't seen it, you can check out my spoiler-free video. I did do a spoiler-free video. I'll put a link to that in the description below. I went and I did that video right after I saw it in the theaters because uh, I had this nifty little poster here that I got from the theaters when I went and saw it. Uh, it was really great, so you can check out that video if you want. So, talking about this documentary, I. I enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was good for a documentary. I typically am not a huge fan of documentaries in general just because I prefer the fictionalized storytelling because I've actually uh, studied documentary filmmaking and made a couple sort of amateur documentaries and I, I know that it's all documentaries are storytelling in a sense. Nothing is completely non-fictional and you do have to construct a narrative and you have to create interviews to sort of construct your narrative that way. And, um, and so that's why I kind of just prefer the straight out fiction <laughs> storytelling because every kind of storytelling is a version of fiction. But anyway, this documentary itself opens the movie by acknowledging that, by having Andrew Robinson come out introducing himself as Andrew Robinson, but really he's acting like, he's play acting Garrick. <laughs> he's doing a version of Garrick where he says like, these are only certain versions of events you only hear if, from people's memory and the way they remember things and people may remember things differently. And so this isn't a completely accurate version of the events, but it's the best we humans can do. And I love that. I love that se sequence so much. It's such a great way to start the film. Of course, it, it sets the tone because it has Garrick acting as Garrick, and they acknowledge later in the film that Garrick is a fan favorite. And so I think every documentary should have a uh, disclaimer like that because that's true. Basically, you know, political documentaries documentaries about birds it doesn't matter what it's about <laughs> every documentary is just a sort of a form of narrative storytelling where the creator has a narrative in mind so they only show you the, what interviews or give you the information that helps their narrative again this is just about a tv show if it was one just about birds it didn't matter <laughs> that's basically how documentaries work but anyway, so i love this one so much but anyway before this we get this opening like lounge scene that they have rum and you know the lyrics are kind of funny it's about the space nine but you should know how i feel about lounge singing <laughs> but to be fair well First of all, at least it wasn't Vic Fontaine. And secondly, <laughs> at least it wasn't in Deep Space Nine itself. Like, I don't mind the lawn singing numbers. Although, I honestly think they should have... This one should have went. But I don't mind it as much as the lawn singing in Deep Space Nine itself. Because that was in my science fiction show where it shouldn't fucking be. Where here it's just a documentary so you can play a bit more fast and loose. Uh, with things, I guess. Um, so yeah, and the, once we get into the documentary, you start they started with like these angry letters from fans, which I actually love. This where <laughs> fans are trashing Deep Space Nine because this is something I actually brought up myself a lot uh, in regards to uh, when Discovery first came out. Is that so many people trash Discovery? And they're still to this day a large, active online. Uh, group or, fan, or a group of fans who were like-minded fans who despise Discovery and trash it. And I think they're kind of they're doing the same thing to Picard. Even before it came out, they're prejudging it, so they're already convinced that it's going to suck. So when it comes out, they'll find that they're correct, regardless of how good or bad it is. They've already made up their minds on that one. It sucks. Um, and it, it's funny that this is not a new phenomenon. This is something I try to always constantly remind people that this is just a natural response to any sort of new installment of any established franchise. You could say this about movie franchise like Star Wars. You can say it about TV shows. Uh, you could say it about bands. Like if an established band is very well known for a particular song or a particular album and years later they come out with a new album, Everyone's going to say that new album sucks, or they're going to be a lot more critical of it because they're used to their older version of what they have in their mind of what this band should be. And it's, it's really the same thing uh, with Star Trek, but then years later, because it was the same thing with Next Generation, 
Uh, you had protests that people couldn't stand that show. And it's interesting to see it's the same thing with Deep Space Nine, because these shows are both now considered masterpieces by the track fan base at large. There's a lot of people who, who say Discovery's complete and total shit love Deep Space Nine. Whereas uh, when Deep Space Nine first came out, it wasn't so well loved as it is now. It's just given time, people were able to digest it with time and accept it as worthy. So it's always the new property always has a lot more resistant to it. And of course they said things like my friend would used to say things like this to me when D Space Nine first came out. Oh, they're just sitting on a space station. Oh, this isn't Star Trek. <laughs> and I love how they, they... And they even had interviews from fans who now love the show who even talked about how they first were very resistant and rejected from. And I've heard, uh, I've read, you know, watched videos from other YouTubers who reviewed Deep Space Nine and talked about how they stopped watching the show because they didn't like it. I was all, I watched it all the way through. I mean, I missed a couple episodes here and there, uh, particularly when we get to the later season, season five and six, which it's kind of ironic seeing how those are the ones that were more serialized, but uh, that was just a busier time in my life. Um, but, um... Yeah, but I always stuck through the show throughout, but I heard that vitriol. I remember hearing that vitriol, so it's kind of, it's not a new phenomenon. So, and it's actually kind of funny in the documentary, the way the actors read them, and some of the letters themselves are kind of funny. Uh, and Ira Stephen Bear himself said that he kind of, it's he it didn't deter him. He felt bad for the actors because actors like praise, and that's why they act. But and so it must have been difficult for them. But he himself says that he, if he's not pissing people off, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, so it encouraged him, which I don't agree with his reasoning there. Because does that mean that Ryan Johnson and Dan Dave are, are brilliant? Because they're pissing a lot of people off. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I don't think they are. Anyway, um. Then we get this bit about Avery Brooks, how, uh, you know, um, they wouldn't let him shave his head and grow a goatee uh, for the first two seasons. And this documentary, they have some interviews that kind of presented as there's a racial element to this. And Calum Neamey, who plays with Brian, even goes as far as to say that uh, they're kind of sort of painting him not quite as an Uncle Tom, but kind of leaning that way in order to make him more digestible to white audiences. And... I've watched a couple of videos where they hated this and it basically presented it as SJW propaganda or whatever. Um, and I, I hate the term SJW. I think it's a bullshit term. But in this particular case, like, there's some... Maybe there's some other reasons why they didn't want Avery Brooks to shave his head. Maybe because they were trying to be different in the next generation and they didn't... Picard had a shaved head and they were trying to differentiate the two shows... Or maybe the fact that Avery Brooks is already recognizable from the previous show as Hulk, and he had that same look with the bald head and the goatee, and they wanted to differentiate him from that character. That could be an element. And but you know the race thing that could be an element as well. I'm not saying I'm not siding with one or the other. I think the documentary like skews it to it's definitely racial and there's. SG, anti SUW crowd is human is like totally not racial. I think has in most cases the answer is somewhere in between. Anyway, um, something I also think is pretty interesting, and I'll touch into I'll touch on the uh, the whole mythical season eight. I'll touch on that towards the end of the video. I actually go through all the stuff in the, in the documentary to talk about the actual show. And look on the past first before I get into this mythical season eight. But I just did real quick wanted to touch on how I feel that um, it was interesting seeing the writers break down an episode like this because I feel this is a really a glimpse into how episodes used to be written uh, back when the show was on, um, where they throw out ideas and how these writers actually they're really good at yes anding each other. They'll like they'll take an idea and say like, oh, that doesn't quite work, but what if we do this? And they sort of build off each other. And that's very educational for me as a writer because I've had my own sort of, you know, amateur experiences uh, <laughs> at, you know, school or whatnot and working on, uh, you know, small short films. 
and uh, I've always had a rough time with trying to work with other writers. I think the key is to try to find people that you can work with and that you can gel with. And it seems like these, part of the reason why it's so smooth in this segment, because these writers all knew each other and had a nice working relationship and knew they could sort of bounce ideas off each other and work and express something. But, and this is something I'll talk about more when I cover the Mythical Season 8, is that this is basically just a rough draft. And they even talk about this, how typically it's 5 o'clock, they'd stop, they'd go home, they think about it, they come back with fresh new ideas. And from my own personal experience, it's definitely the case if you have time away to break from the process and just let it stew, then you often come out with see things in a new perspective and so because they didn't do that and because like they didn't get usually like when they would actually break down the episode they would have it run through several process like the producers or whatever would see it and make notes and be like oh maybe change this or maybe this isn't working they'd ask for outside advice who's not there and they'd be like actually maybe you should do this and the product would completely change from what originally was like a good example of this is the episode in the pale moonlight which I just uh, reviewed that that originally Originally was an idea about uh, Jake uh, doing a investigative reporting on Minister Shakar, and it turned out if you know the episode is about Cisco tricking the Romulans into joining the war and Garrick sort of manipulating him into uh, committing being accessory to murder and, and stuff and, and deceiving the Romulans, and so that has nothing to do with the original idea. And so I could see how episodes could evolve in that way once they've been through uh, many hands and had time to stew whereas here this this mythical season eight episode is it's a rough draft it's basically just the first draft because they don't really have they only have one day to sort of break it out but it was very interesting to see what that working what that writing process looks like um and then I got to talk about the HD clips. Like they had a whole segment. They even showed this in the theater of explaining why they did the HD clips and how they did it. I find that kind of boring. <laughs> Typically, I don't care about HD high definition. I, I would watch things in standard definition most of the time just because it's cheaper. I, I usually can't tell the difference. But with Deep Space Nine, the show I've seen so many times and I love so much, I can definitely tell the difference. It was definitely really... Uh, amazing seeing this in, in the theater. Like the cinematic experience of actually seeing these clips, especially the battle clips, like these special effects, <laughs> it's amazing how well they hold up. Like a lot of shows from the 90s do not hold up as well as this one. Uh, so it's amazing seeing these the fancy special effects and the battle sequences and even the, the just the clips of just the characters talking. I wish I could see a whole episode in HD now, but maybe eventually they'll get to that. But it, it was just so amazing. Uh, it was definitely in the theater, but even watching it at home on DVD, it's still much cooler to, to see that high quality. I think I, I do agree. It was definitely because they were going to... They had to delay the film for like a year, I think, or maybe even more, in order to uh, change the clips into high definition. I definitely think it was worth it. All right, so next they have a little segment about women in Star Trek, and again, USJW, <laughs> whatever bullshit. But I actually really appreciated um, the segment uh, and how they had interviews with the women who were, who were fans who felt inspired by uh, saying there's a rare occurrence in the 90s shows to have strong, independent women, particularly Kira, uh, who was very strong and independent. And even Anana Visitor talked about how the character didn't seem like a typical woman. It was kind of written like a man. She really appreciated that because it, you didn't have the gender association or gender judge, judgment on that. Uh, which was very typical in Hollywood in the 90s, not so typical in modern era. Uh, but even so, I do think there were some shows in the 90s that were like this. I think it was becoming more common in the 90s, even though it wasn't as commonplace as it is in modern times. I don't think Deep Space Nine was the only show doing it, but it was still, uh, still interesting to get acknowledgement of that in this documentary. Um, and then you had, I learned about... Uh, 
how Armin Shimon, who played Quark, sorry if I'm pronouncing that name wrong, how he would hold these rehearsals for all the Ferengi. Whenever they were doing a Ferengi episode, all the actors who were going to be in that Ferengi episode would invite them over to his house and they'd have a rehearsal and it'd be like a nice get-together. That was cool. That was interesting to hear that and they talked about how it was rare for actors to do that. And I guess it showed how much he cared about the show and cared about his part was willing to throw in the extra work and, and the people the other actors who were invited to this like so this is a nice get together and I, I thought that was that was cool and how they had this they almost formed this little family um doesn't change the fact that the Frankie episodes suck though <laughs> But that had less to do with the acting and more to do with the writing. And uh, in other interview, Iron Stephen Barrett talked about how he regretted writing so many Ferengi episodes as he realized that it probably wasn't the strength of the show. I definitely agree. So then they had this little segment on the... They started talking about the three-parter that began season two, The Circle, The Siege, and The Homecoming. And they didn't really talk about them, though. They just talked to Iron Stephen Bear, talked about how rare it was to have a three-parter. And that this is the first realization he had that this Deep Space Nine could be something different. So eventually, when he ended up taking over, he kept pushing and pushing for more serialization. Of course, the studio kept pushing back. But <laughs> eventually, he was able to accomplish a lot. They had long-term... Uh, character arcs, long current char character stories that supporting characters that keep coming up, and then of course season six would do a seven episode arc, and then season seven would do an eleven episode story arc, or ten, really, if it's, if it's a two parter. But anyway, um, and so, and also in the later seasons, like. <laughs> You could rarely watch an episode without being lost because it was so separate referential. There were even the ones out episodes outside of these story arcs were heavily referencing like the whole Dominion War or certain characters or certain events from previous episodes that if you miss an episode you would be lost and not really know what's going on. And the Iron Stephen Bear talked about how the studios fought back against it and and uh, Rick Berman was very much against it and he was saying how they would actively tell him that you're killing the show and they even said that the, the ratings did drop so he does believe that they were correct that he was killing the show by doing this because this is before the day of streaming services before the day even of DVD collections so the only way to watch an episode was to watch it on TV live as it aired or rerun and so if you miss an episode, you'd be lost. You have no way of going back and watching that episode. You would have to go to reruns and try to catch it at the right time as they're cycling through, which I know from experience is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so I can understand what they were saying, but Iron Stephen Barry even points out that he didn't care about any. He acknowledges that they were right, probably, but he didn't care because he wanted to do what was best for the story, what was best for the show, the story of the show, and what was best for it was to tell it in a serialized manner, and he was totally right. And then they also bring up how, because of this, though, because of the modern era of streaming services and DVD collections, the show has got a much bigger following in modern times than it ever had before because people are are able to consume it the way it's meant to be consumed by watching every episode in the correct order uh, and so it's appreciated a lot more in modern times and I totally believe that and I think these, that's part of the reason why Deep Space Nine has such a resurgence and, <laughs> and I talked about the haters that used to hate on the show when it first came out even those who did watch every episode would hate on it um, but that's less common because this is kind of the way it was always intended to be viewed in this sort of serialized uh, fashion, and that's that's what makes it unique. That's what makes it really good. And see, Iron Stephen Bear would have made it more serialized had he had his druthers, but uh, the studios he was barely able to get away with what he did because the studios were constantly fighting on it. And he said that they had a point, but again, it the show would have been better. Voyager would have been better if it was at least bit serialized, but you know that's another topic altogether. And then. <laughs> Then they have, they mention uh, Odo and Kira, their romance, and I thought this was a really interesting segment because they say that the writers base this off of the actors because the actors, they 
didn't plan to do an Odo and Kira romance, but they saw the, the chemistry, they saw the spark, the romance through the performances of the actors, and that these characters had something, so they eventually, you know, first it was just a, a crush Odo had, but it developed and developed and eventually became a romance, and this is why, I totally agree with this, and this is why I love this couple. I know a lot of people don't like the Odo and Kira romance, I respectfully disagree, I, it's one of my favorite romances in all of Star Trek, and it's because of that natural, because I can tell, too, that it developed naturally. It's something that the writers saw was a natural development rather than just decreeing that two characters be together even though they had no chemistry previously. Uh, Tom and Bellana! <coughs> <coughs> or even Chakotay and 709, but oh, <laughs> let's not fucking go there. <laughs> so, and Deep Space Nine did that. And that's why I think Voyager typically, because Voyager was always like, I talked about this in my Voyager reviews. I don't go on a, I want to go on a, and a, just you know too much off topic, but um, the Doctor in Seven and Nine that was something natural. But Rick Berman decreed that they not do it, even though it made total and complete sense for the characters. But and this is why I think a lot of ways Deep Space Nine is better than Voyager because it had less of that studio interference. The, inter the high, the studio heads, Rick Berman, people like that cared more about Voyager than Deep Space Nine. So they were able, and rather decreeing that certain characters be together, they're able to build naturally off of what char characters could do. But on the other hand, <laughs> Iron Stephen Bear wanted Ducat and Kira to have a romance, and that was a horrible idea. And thankfully, Nana Visitor recognized this and was completely and totally against it. And, and uh, basically, Iron Stephen Bear says that uh, she would let him do it. And I'm thankful for that because that's a terrible idea. And, and um, it was such a funny little segment in, in the documentary because they have uh, Kira, like, uh, when she mentions that Iris Stephen Mary came to her and said that he wrote an episode with her in a romance to Cot, uh, he's like, oh, I never did that. And she, oh, she gets very upset. But then we cleared up that uh, she he didn't write the episode specifically, but he did have that as an idea that he wanted to do. Uh, that the episode he had written was the one where uh, Ducat, he's like, okay, you win. Ducat doesn't have a romance with Kira, but he does have a romance with Kira's mother. <laughs> and that episode, by the way, is sucks. <laughs> I don't I I think I should say I don't like it uh, because I think that is that is a silly retcon to have Ducat have a romance with it. It kind of muddles Kira and Ducat's relationship, and it makes it a bit silly in retrospect that the only reason he's crushing on her because he used to bang his mom, her mom. That's silly. I don't like it. <laughs> I just think it ruins the the whole dynamic. But anyway, that's getting a bit off topic. Uh, the documentary also had this little segment on Damar, uh, which I thought was a really cool segment, um, because it showed how the, um, this was just a bit character at first, it just came in to read a line saying, oh, the shields are down, or whatever, and, and eventually, uh, and I love how they showed the clips, like, they had the actor saying that, oh, Damar went from, and they showed a clip of Damar saying, oh, the shields are down, blah, blah, and then two, and they have him doing the speech, uh, about uh, how the Cardassians need to resist the Dominion and how he's this like strong resistance figure, and that, and the writers themselves described Damar as their big, biggest success story, and I never looked at it that way, but I would definitely see that is a huge deal that they're able to take such a tiny character and turn him into such a great character, and it was a pretty good actor who played them, by the way, so they saw potential in that, so that that is that is something definitely worth praise that I never really thought of. Uh, in those terms before. On the other hand, they also said previously in a previous segment in the documentary that Nog had the best character arc or most full character arc in the show, and I could not disagree with that more. Not a huge fan of Nog, if you know me, <laughs> but uh, I do agree with them here about uh, Damar. Um, so they also talk a bit about the Dominion War. Um, and how they, you know, explain the idea of the Dominion, of having an enemy in the uh, in the Gamma Quadrant uh, come and. Uh yeah, it's just really interesting, and they get into more detail. I mean, this isn't things that I didn't 
Nothing I already knew, but they talked about how they just didn't want to do the Klingons or the Romulans or the Borg. They didn't want to do what other Star Trek. They wanted to sort of create their own enemy. I love the way Iron Stephen Bear, he's always self-deprecating. It's like, oh, we're two, we couldn't commit to one alien in case it didn't work, so we made three. <laughs> but really, it's just one entity, the Dominion. But, um, but yeah, of course, the Dominions and the Dominion War, of course, is a huge like aspect of why Deep Space Nine works is a huge positive aspect uh, overall. Um, all right, and then they talk about the introduction of Worf and Michael Dorn, and this is kind of interesting because you hear actors like Andrew Robinson and other actors talking about how they, they had nothing against Michael Dorn, of course. They thought he was a lovely person, but um, they were very threatened by his Worf's introduction to these Space Nine because they had to feel like people didn't feel the show was good enough and they needed a next generation character in order to boost the show. And I actually kind of agree. I kind of feel that way too. That's why when people say, oh, the show didn't start getting good until Worf was introduced, I got to strongly disagree with that. I think the show was already great before Worf was introduced. And I kind of actually, I don't think Worf's introduction damages the show. Let me make that clear. I think the show is still just as great as it would have been without him. But I don't think it's better because of him. Um, I, I don't think he was necessary. Uh, actually, I do kind of think that season four and five would have been better without him. Certainly would have been better without the, the, the Klingon introduction. The, it's focusing on the Klingon war and stuff. I do think that was an aside that hurt the show. And it was, by all accounts, something that was mandated by the studios. It's not something the writers came up with themselves. The studios told, said that we need, to, we're not getting, our ratings aren't high enough. We need to attract more people. Um... So you have to introduce Worf. And it was funny because Ronald D. Moore in, the, in this documentary couldn't even remember if the, the, the war specifically was an idea of the studio or an idea of the producers. Uh, but it was definitely an idea you need a next generation character uh, to boost the ratings of the show. And I like, and so I'm actually with the actors here that it was totally unnecessary. And I could see why they would be threatened by this. And uh, Nana Visitor in particular said that she was threatened that Worf would become the second in command or the the executive, you know, the second charge of the, you know, second highest character in the show behind Cisco, and that Kira would be relegated to bringing them coffee. And I think that's a very real, real concern. That's a very valid concern because I actually do think at times during the fourth and fifth seasons. It does feel like that. It does feel like they're kind of pushing Kira aside in order to make Worf more important of a character. And he they essentially made him the first officer of the Defiant. But Kira was the first officer of Deep Space Nine. Uh, so this, the episodes that were more station-oriented did have Kira more in command. But the, stations, the episodes that were more Defiant-oriented had Worf as more of a main character. So I do think for seasons four and five, at the very least, Kira and Worf were both equal. So Kira was no longer the second most important character on the show. She was now sort of had to share that with Worf. But I do think that the later seasons, uh, six and seven, corrected this and did have Kira be, again, be the first officer, because every show has their first officer. I mean, Riker's the first officer, Spock's your first officer. They're always, they always have that, 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 you know, the spotlight. But it seems like Kira had that for the first three seasons, but then lost it to Worf. Uh, so I think her concerns was actually very damn valid. Um, but, so, yeah, I can't even agree with her there. Uh, but then they have another segment where they talk about uh, Terry Farrell leaving the show. Uh, this was very interesting to me because this is something I don't know much about. I had actually, some of my videos previously, had misreported this because I had read reports that she was the problem. Uh, that uh, she was rude to the other actors and to the producers. No one liked her and so she, they kind of pushed her off the show. But he's seeing this... You get her side of the story, and her side of the story is very different. And I can see that that other story that I heard is not really accurate because you can see she gets along well with the other 
cast members of the show, and they even talk about how they didn't have any problem with her. And they and Ronald D. Moore even talked about how he how surprised he was that she left the show, and he was like, surely that wouldn't happen. So it seems very clear that whatever the dispute was, it was between Terry Farrell and the studio and the high producers of the show, not the not the act, other actors or the writing staff. Or at least that's how it's presented in this documentary. Again, you go back to what Garrick said at the start. This is kind of one-sided, relying on people's memories. And, um, but from the way she tells, of course, she starts crying, gets really emotional. That, she, that you know, someone said that if she, they basically, when they're negotiating contracts, it's like, you better just take this contract, otherwise you'll just be screwed and you'll, you'll just be working on, at a Kmart without this show. Which is a really dick thing to say. <laughs> and I don't doubt that someone said that. She said producer. She didn't name anyone. But I have a, a feeling that's Rick Berman. Because I've heard other stories of him saying very rude, ash things to people like that. It does sound like... If based on these other interviews, it does sound like something that he would say. Um, so now... So it did sort of enlighten me seeing this part of the segment. Saying that the story was actually quite different. Now I get the impression that she was on the losing end, that she was the one who was screwed off the show. Because we always talked about how silly it was, like, there's only one season left of the show, so why not just stick around for one season? But if what she says is true, then you can kind of see why. But again, getting back to what Garrick says, you're only seeing one side of the story. Anyway, um, they do do another, they have another segment with, uh, about Kira, uh, where none of the visitors talking about how Kira had this story arc, uh, with PTSD and how, actually, so I would actually counter this, because earlier in the documentary they said Nog, well it was one of the writers that said that, that Nog had the, the biggest story arc, but here none of the visitors talking about Kira's story arc, and I actually agree with her, so I would say Kira has the biggest story arc because she and they point out examples of the first and second season of how uh jumpy she was and, and not enough visitor talked about playing her that way that she was set off she was always on guard always on edge and that slowly throughout the course of the show that she learned to move past that she learned to live with her trauma with her post-traumatic stress uh, disorder and sort of, uh, and then they show clips towards season seven where she's much more calm, much more in control of herself. And I do think that's a natural progression. So I, yeah, I agree with Donna Visitor. Kira had the best story arc of any character in these Space Nine, in my opinion. Uh, anyway, uh, they do also talk a bit about how D Space Nine treats war in general and how it has a very grown up. This is something I talked about a lot in my reviews of D Space Nine. I love how the documentary touched on how Deep Space Nine has a very grown, even though it does portray war, which is very much against Gene Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek, blah, 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 but it has a very anti-war message. It has a very mature message of war, that war should be avoided at all costs. There's no such thing. I love how the interview is fan that says this. There's no such thing as a just war or righteous war or good war. All war is bad. And uh, it's, sometimes it might be unavoidable or necessary, but it doesn't make it heroic or, uh, you know, something to be glorified. And that's what Deep Space Time makes very clear. And that's why I think the ending of the show works so well. Because it didn't end with all oh, the Federation beats the Dominion and the heroes win and it's happily ever after. It was a very dark, fucked up way. And that is so true to Deep Space Nine overlining a message because Star Trek has always had the message that war is bad no matter what. And so I, I suppose that's why a lot of people were against Star Trek exploring war, but they can still explore war and keep that same message that war is not good. <laughs> it is something to be avoided uh, try it at all cost. But anyway, um, so then... Uh, what else do we get into next? So then we get the checklist. And this is something that the video that was anti-SGW. Damn, SGW, they bashed the checklist as well. I was like, this is horrible. SGW is going to leave your politics out of Star Trek. I'm like, you know what? Um, and some apparently a lot of people complained that this documentary was too political. They're not say, pointing out anything that already doesn't exist in the show. You realize this. They're not 
making Deep Space Nine more political than it was. They're actually pointing out how political it was. So it's already this political. So for you to complain, leave your politics out of Star Trek or Deep Space Nine, makes zero sense. Because basically what you're saying is, I want to be ignorant, I want to ignore the fact that these political messages exist in Star Trek. And if someone points it out to me, how dare you? I don't want you pointing it out to me. I want to just close my eyes and ears and go, me, 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 no politics. Sorry, these messages already exist. And if you watch the show, you like the show, you appreciate the show, you at least have to acknowledge that these messages exist and you shouldn't get all pouty and pissy when the documentary points, points it out to you. And I think there's nothing wrong with them pointing out and there's nothing wrong with celebrating these very strong uh, commentary on social issues, which I also agree with the creators of this documentary is a highlight of Deep Space Nine, part of what makes this show great. Now, if you happen to disagree with this particular message and you don't think it makes this show great, fine, that's your opinion. In fact, it would be very natural for you to kind of hold that against the show and not appreciate it as much because it has messages that you personally don't agree with. But to say, fuck you documentary for making this more political than it is, is bullshit because it's already this political. You just are choosing to ignore it. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> Let me get into, like, okay, so they had the checklist, they point out they had the religion and other issues, and then they get to sexual identity, they show an interview with a, a fan who says, I really appreciate the work you did to explore sexual identity, and uh, then they put a check on that, but then they cut to the scene where our Steve Bear's in the editing room, and he turns to the editor, and he goes... Now nah, give her that. Give her the checklist. We don't deserve this. And I kind of I've seen interviews with Iron Stephen Bear before. I watched this documentary, so I already knew that was his position. That he strongly feels that they didn't do enough uh, to um, that they could have done more uh, with sexual identity and, of course, uh, you know the LGBT community and stuff like that. He feels like they didn't do enough. And the, the, the editor is like, what? But Rejoined was a great episode. I thought it really explored, you know, sexual identity. And I agree. Of course, I did a video all about Rejoined on my channel. <laughs> that you can check out and how is, I think it's the best episode to in early Star Trek. That is, you know, bef before Discovery, you know, Enterprise and before is the best episode to explore the LGBT community and issues. I think that's what I do. Uh, I know some people, particularly in the LGBT community, that do have some issues with Rejoin and don't think it did enough. And obviously, uh, Iris Stephen Bear feels the same way. But I, I, I do think it could have been better for sure. But I do. Th it is out of the examples we have. I think it's definitely the best. Uh, and you know, of course, I've heard the opinion of some people saying they don't even think it touches that issue, but I think they're outright incorrect. I mean, <laughs> the the whole episode is an analogy. Now, some people argue it's a flawed analogy, but it is an analogy on the discrimination homosexuals face, and it features the same-sex couple at the same time. That's something that the fucking outcast didn't do. Uh, <laughs> And, and so I actually do agree that really works, but I understand Stephen Barrett says that they should have made, they should have had uh, Garrick, they should have made Garrick uh, um, homosexual, because pan, or pansexual, because uh, Andrew Robinson wanted to make Garrick pansexual. In fact, they showed that first scene with Garrick where he's flirting with Bashir. He is. And that's because that's how the actor played it, and the director encouraged this, but of course... The studio and the head producers after they saw this scene, like, no. So when Garrick reappeared, they're like, they, it was decreed that they drop the whole pansexual thing, and so they had to drop the whole act. Um, but I actually, and again, the anti SCW people, oh, the stupid Garrick wasn't gay. But you watch that first scene, he totally was. <laughs> he was pansexual. And I kind of agree with Iron Stephen Bear that that would have been interesting. And it would have been brave for them to do to have a pansexual character, especially a male pansexual character, which wasn't considered as, you know, sexy or whatever, because they did stuff with the Mary Universe, but I think that was mostly for like sex appeal. Um, but uh, I I I don't agree with Iron Stephen Bear that 
that he doesn't deserve the check. I think he deserves a check for a rejoin. Sure, he should have done. He could have done more. But the editor's like, well, you know, could you have done more? He's like, well, maybe not. But I didn't even try. But I think he's being a bit too hard on himself. Even though I agree, like. Uh, because uh, Andrew Robbins talked about how the, the relationship between Garrick and Bashir was sexual at first, like it was all he just wanted to have sex with them, but later they it grew beyond that. And I think if they played it more like that, it would have been interesting or made it more clear that Garrick was pansexual. But I think it's fine. Uh, however, I do have to talk about how the editor, when he's arguing with Iron Stephen Bear about this, he specifically says, oh, what about Profit and Lace? That reads better today than even than it did before when it, when it aired. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Is this what Iron Stephen Bear thinks? Like, how can the editor think this? Um, Profit and Lace plays much worse in modern times than it did when it first aired. In fact, it was kind of outdated even when it first aired. Like, uh, I know it tries to play with sexual identity, but it actually comes off as incredibly sexist. Uh, it has a character try to rape Quark as a woman and an and has another character brunt when Quark kisses another man as a woman because he's, you know, actually, you know... He's actually uh, had an operation to make himself a woman. And he, Brunt is disgusted by the fact that Quark is kissing another man. Disgusted by... I mean, I wouldn't truly call it Quark, Quark in his face transgender because he's just doing his employ and he'll go right back to being a male. So he, he's not a true transgendered person. And that's, again, another strike against this episode. It doesn't actually deal with... Uh, sexual identity in the transgender community. It's just some guy uh, <laughs> having a surgery to, to, or means of an end. Uh, and plus, he's never truly homosexual either. Uh, he's just kissing another guy again, means of the end. And Brunt's disgusted by it. Oh, how, oh, look, a transgendered woman or a man, if you want to put it that way, is kissing another man. That's disgusting. This, and this is the message you want to, this is the episode you want to use to promote sexual, what the fuck is, what is wrong with this editor? And he's lost to be, amongst the fan base, this is considered the one, the worst episode of Deep Space Nine, largely considered the worst episode of Deep Space Nine. It was voted one of the worst episodes of the entire Star Trek franchise by the fans. It was made in the top ten. So, what are they, are they really this delusional that they think this actually promotes sexual identity in any way? <sighs> but anyway, I just, that really stuck out to me. <sighs> All right, so let me talk about something else that bothers me that I received in Bear said in this documentary. He said he he even like at one point he stops in the writers' room and he's like, "Can we give ourselves a pat on the back? Can we congratulate ourselves for?" Never for making sure that Bajor never got in the Federation. I always thought it was stupid that Bajor never joined the Federation. And I'll get more into this when we get into this mythical Season 8 episode, but I think that uh, I didn't like... It. Iron Stephen Bear had this attitude about Roddenberry's vision from the future, and some to some extent I agree that because Roddenberry was not a good writer and he often put restrictions on Next Generation that hindered the writing because he was so rigid about his uh, vision for this perfect future. But I do agree with his vision for the perfect future. And so when Iris Stephen Bear really actively, uh, actively attacks it, sometimes I disagree. In this case of he's thinking of, the Federation, of Bajor joining the Federation as a horrible thing, as a bad thing, and that they lose their own identity... I think he misunderstands what the Federation is and what Roddenberry's vision is. And so I actually always fucking hated the fact that Bajor never joined the Federation. And it made sense for season five because I love the, it's the Locust! Like, because there was a ceremony when Bajor was about to join the Federation, but uh, Cisco had visions that it would spell doom. And apparently you find out later it did spell doom because Dominion would have conquered them if that was the case. But once the Dominion War was over, once that's over, there's no reason why. Bajor shouldn't join the Federation. In fact, in the novels that go beyond uh, Season 7 of Deep Space Nine, Bajor does, does join the Federation. I think that was 
uh, a natural progression that was actually great. And so this thing with, with Iron Steel, oh, are we so great? Isn't that awesome? The page one, and the fuck you. Sorry, it's not. It's stupid. Page one should do the Federation, and you don't fucking understand what the Federation actually is. So, again, <laughs> I love Iron Stephen Bear. He did so good, so much good for Deep Space Nine, but not. I don't agree with his every opinion, and especially the introducing lounge singers in the fucking sixth season. <sighs> I, what's, uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is in that, you know, breaking down the mythical season eight, our Stephen Bear says, section 31 is ours. We know that um, they introduced them in, into darkness, but it actually belongs to us. Now, as I said, this, this writer's room is breaking down mythical season eight. This is all the way back, filmed all the way back in 2015. So this is way before Discovery kind of came out. So I do wonder how he feels about what Discovery is doing with Section 31. Because they were barely mentioned in the darkness. But they want to do a whole show <laughs> about uh, Discovery's version of Section 31. And there was a major uh, component to Season 2. Now, I would find it hard to believe that Iron Stephen Bear doesn't feel the same way about Discovery Section 31 that I do. And that is that it sucks and that it totally goes and contradicts, goes against the legacy of what they established in Deep Space Nine. Uh, so it's kind of a shame that he didn't, uh, that this was made before Discovery and they didn't elaborate. But I have a feeling that they wouldn't actively attack Discovery. But I have a, also have a feeling that uh, Iron Stephen Bear, not a fan. Anyway, speaking of the mythical season 8, let me finally get to that. Uh, let me finally break this down uh, for you. Let's get. Oh, let me get head up on this. Now, ultimately, because people had told me what I thought about this, and if they did air the first episode of season eight exactly how it's described here, I would not think it's very good. To be perfectly frank, but as I fully acknowledge that this is a first draft. This is a rough draft. And that's something that's important. To note because if we did get an actual season eight i don't think this would be the i think this would be the first draft and that it would get a lot of passovers it would get a lot of touch-ups and what we would get would turn out being much better and so this is basically and it, that's not what this is intended to be by the way it's intended to be a fun exercise of uh what if and they just got together from the day and just roughly threw this out so it is what it is. It's, it, that's what it is. It's good for what it is. It's good for this hypothetical episode that maybe could have existed. But it, it, that's all it is. If, and it's fun to see. I love this part of the documentary. Like the animation drawings and stuff were really cool. But if this was an actual episode, I would not like it. Uh, so let me get into this. So the, the setting up with D Space Nine is now Bajoran Shrine. And. I'm not sure I like that setup. Again, I kind of like the post Deep Space Nine novels better, which continue off. Although it's set immediately after season seven ends, this is set 20 years later. So maybe Deep Space Nine comes to shrine, maybe not. I guess I don't have that big of an issue. Like if they had an actual episode to air with that, I wouldn't discount it. Uh, then they had Ezri as captain. The novels made Ezri a captain, too. And I don't, I don't know why everyone wants to make Ezri a captain. I don't really think that she works as a captain. I don't know why everyone thinks she'd be a captain. But she's married to Bashir. And that part I do like. Because the novels did... the One of the first things they did was broke up Ezri and Bashir. And I guess they were in a camp that didn't like Ezri and Bashir together. I did like Ezri and Bashir together. Again, this was something that was a natural occurrence that the writers did. And I love how the writers in, the, in this little breakdown thing said that, oh, someone needs to still be together. <laughs> I agree with them. Uh, so I did really like that. And then they had Worf is next aligned to rule the Klingon Empire. I didn't like that. Um, I don't have the biggest issue with that, but Worf was the Starfleet officer. Why is he going to... Oh, even like all good things showed him going back to the Klingon. Empire. Why does he always have to go back to the Klingon Empire? Why can't he stay in Starfleet? Uh, so Quark calls everyone to the station and you find out it's because Vic Fontaine is dying. Now you should know how I feel about this. 
<laughs> Vic Fontaine. That's so dumb. Uh, the, I wanted to write it just like Vic Fontaine. I would rather, of course, they leave him out of this. And um, then they kill off Nog. Now, he talks about how this would piss off everyone. And everyone would be so upset. They even had this funny scene later where they had the actor who played Nog being like, Don't kill off Nog! <laughs> like, that was funny. But you should know me. I, I'm not bothered by this. <laughs> this is actually one aspect of the episode I would not mind at all. And then they introduce a, a new character, Major Pollock, who's like the Bajoran major, who's like part of this Bajoran conspiracy, and Kira's like a Vedic now, so she's kind of walking the line. Again, I don't know. I, I'm not all that keen on Kira being a Vedic, but... Whatever. If they introduced that, I would be fine with it. And then they also introduced Joseph Sisko, who is, you know, uh, Jake's brother. You know, the because the show ended with Cassie Yates was uh, pregnant. And so this is obviously her son. Um, and so that aspect is really interesting. Also, Molly's an officer in Deep Space Nine, so that was also interesting. And it's funny, in the writer's room, they bring up Odo, because this is like a mystery, so it's, oh, it's natural to have bring in the, the detective. But then Aaron Stephen Bear is like, no, 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 we don't need Odo here, because we don't have to throw everything in the first episode. We can introduce him later in the season. Which is a bit annoying, because this is a hypothetical episode. There are going to be no episodes later in the season. You're only bringing down the one episode so why not just use Odo but I guess he was looking at it from the perspective that it would actually like they're pretending that there would be a season long so if he was writing a season long season that he wouldn't introduce Odo he would starve him off but it still kind of annoys me I'm like you're not though you're not writing a whole season you're just doing this one episode so why not just include Odo but whatever um <laughs> and then so they have um the reveal that Kira was arguing with Nog, so it increases the mystery. I actually agree with, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Brene, I can't pronounce his last name, who brought this up in the writer's room that um, Odo was natural to have him because he was the detective and this is a mystery, so it's uh, natural to have a detective because without him, they kind of make... Esri the detective, and that just doesn't work, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you could argue that one episode in the seventh season with the mass murder with the rifle thing, but that was a really bad episode, so I would make that argument. Um, so then uh, Kira kicks you know, Esri and everyone off the station to ask them to leave, uh, and then we get this reveal, Garrick gives Odo, not Odo, uh, Garrick gives Worf, which is really weird because... Uh, they talk about early how Garrick hates Worf, and I suppose that's kind of the point. Because it's funny, when Andrew Robinson, they had this scene early in the documentary, Andrew Robinson says, why you kill off Nog? If you have to kill off something, kill off Worf, which is funny because Garrick never really liked Worf. So it's interesting that they have Garrick giving the incriminating evidence to, to Worf, but it's proof that there's a conspiracy that the Bajoran Vedics or... Uh, um, they are inducting the Jimindar there to, into their religion that, uh, the praise the prophets. And I, actually, I don't have that big of an issue with the storyline. This could make sense from a perspective, like, if something happened to the founders, or if the founders lost their hold on the Jimindar, and maybe somehow Odu was involved in this somehow, it kind of makes sense that they would have this hole in their life, this lack of, uh, because they were so, they thought the founders were gods. So it kind of makes sense, uh, since they're, you know, sort of close to the wormhole too, that they could, they would simply join the religion, uh, the Bajoran religion. Uh, so I actually didn't mind that. I actually thought that was kind of interesting. But, let me get into this part that I, that I really hate, and this is probably what really damages the episode for me, and actually makes me really not like it is I heard Stephen Bear is saying that the whole thing, Section 31, is involved and they have a plot to, uh, because they learned about this and they're very strongly against it and they want to, uh, their plot is to destroy the Bajoran religion that way Bajor will join the Federation because they're very anti-religion and they want everyone to be without religion because it lets them... Uh, um, yeah, I hate this. I think this totally goes against uh, Roddenberry's vision for Star Trek. Roddenberry was not, and the vision of Star Trek is not anti-religion. 
is of the notion, a notion that I personally very strongly believe with, that a human society that's extremely advanced, kind of like uh, what Don Lennon was saying in this song, will move beyond religion. And that doesn't mean they will move beyond spiritual beliefs, because McCarty even talked about different philosophies and, and uh, schools of thought on what happens after you die or what happens to how like, the universe was created. But religion, it's organized religion, is kind of inherently, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be offensive to anyone who is religious, but it's inherently a primitive thing. <laughs> and that is that is part of our invasion vision. That's something I 1,000% agree with. So making the Section 31 be evil, and, it's, and in turn it paints the Federation somehow as evil. Like, they want to destroy the cultural identity of any... Uh, culture in order to assimilate it into the Federation and I think that's nonsense. I think Iron, this is again part of what Iron Stephen Bear is his resistance to Ron Ray's vision where I think he's out dead out wrong. Now don't get me wrong Iron Stephen Bear is amazing that made D Space Nine an amazing show but he's not all positive and if they did air this in the episode I would declare it a failure. I would think this is the dumbest thing. It ruined Deep Space Nine. I would hate it beyond hating. And on top of this, the next thing they would do is reveal that Bashir is running Section 31. This is beyond stupid. This completely goes against Bashir's character. It doesn't make the slightest bit of sense of his character and it would destroy Bashir as a character uh, these writers don't give a shit now again to be fair this is a rough draft and I have no doubt people would throw shit like this out all the time in particular I talk about like of course part of it was Bashir being genetically enhanced but they actually decided to run with that and I always blame Ronald D. Moore for that for having because I, he did this in Battlestar Galactica as well of just retconning characters not giving a shit about established continuity or character motivations but I see now it's not just him it's pretty much all these writers in these Space Nine we I mean, not all of them but I can't remember whose idea specifically it was for Bashir to be in charge of Section 31 but ooh wouldn't that be cool because that's the last person you expect Sometimes, the la he's the last person you expect because it doesn't make any sense for his character, and therefore doing it is a stupid idea. Uh, I mean, that's that's like that's uh, what you call that's shock value. That's that's just saying, oh, it's shocking. You don't see this coming. That does not always make good writing, my friend. Any professional writer who knows anything about writing will tell you this, that if you just do things to shock people and it doesn't make sense for the characters, it doesn't actually fit with the character stories, then it's horrible. Now, granted, there's part of me that thinks it has been 20 years and a lot of things could have happened to Bashir in those 20 years to change him and maybe if they reveal he's the head of Section 31 later on, they can, in retrospect, kind of explain how he got that way and it might make sense. But I don't know. I don't think I would, even if they did do that, I still don't think I'd ever truly like this idea. I think it's a horrible idea. I think, you you know, <laughs> who was it? Was it Tuvok that talked about the dictates of narrative that you have to stay true to the character, uh, that anything else is bad writing? I'm sorry, my friend. This is bad writing. So those two things ruined the episode for me. I'm sorry, but they did. So, but you go back to Deep Space Nine, you get the conflict between the Bajorans, like Palak like pulls his guns, and the security man pulls guns on the Starfleet officers, so they refuse to leave, and then Kira actually signs with her friends, the Starfleet officers, against Palak, which I actually did like. I think that was a nice bit of storytelling. And then Cisco magically reappears, which again, I also liked that was a nice bit of storytelling. Uh... So, I did like the end to it. I did think that was good. But all in all, I actually think that the novels did a better job. But again, that's because this is just the first draft. And I have no doubt that uh, once they had a producer who would be like, you can't make Bashir ahead of Section 31, or someone being like, you can't have Section 30, the Federation be evil and want to abolish the religion. That's dumb. <laughs> so I have faith that, that they would develop this idea just like they took in the pale moonlight from, uh, you know, 
Jake being doing investive in journalism, investive in, yeah, investive bleh, journalism on Shakar, and it turned into the best episode ever about Cisco conspiring with Garrick to bring the Romulans into the war by deceit. So, uh, you know, I have enough faith that that if the same machinery exists in the season eight, that they would iron out these issues and they wouldn't be there. But as is. I'm sorry, it's not a good episode. Anyway, <laughs> let's finish up the documentary. Um, I, I thought it was interesting because, as I mentioned, this, this whole breaking down the season 8 was done before Discovery came out, so it made me curious of what these specific four writers who are featured in this would think about Discovery. So I tried to look up their opinions. I mostly couldn't find them. I did find that Ronald D. Moore in an interview talked about French franchise fatigue. Now I've been on record about franchise fatigue and I thought that was not the reason why uh, Enterprise or Star Trek failed after Enterprise. I thought it was because people just weren't interested in what the franchise was doing. Like if the franchise actually put out a good show rather than Enterprise then, then Star Trek would have survived, went on strong, uh, that the only people who had franchise fatigue was the creators of Enterprise. <laughs> uh, because they weren't really trying. Um, but Ronald D. Moore, what he said is that he t said that franchise fatigue was a danger with Star Trek, particularly now when they're introducing, they want to do like Star Trek year-round, have tons of different Star Trek shows, but he said he thinks they can do it. That they can fight all franchise fatigue because every sh if they keep every show different and keep every show new and he talks about how Discovery is very different than what the other Star Trek shows were and how um, uh, the Picard show looks very different than what they did before and they're doing stuff like Lower Decks which is also very different so he says that's how you keep the show fresh that's how you keep Star Trek alive you do something new and fresh and after you just do the same things and he kind of implied that Voyager and Enterprise would kind of just repeating the same things, which I agree, <laughs> I think they definitely were to a degree, and so you need to be more like Deep Space Nine and and keep things fresh and different, uh, and uh, yeah, and he has faith that that's what they're doing. So he didn't give any value judgment on Discovery, but he uh, seemed to imply that he liked the fact that it was different, which is uh, quite different than my friend Brennan Brega over on the Orville, who, they're just doing the same thing, so <laughs> I think he's kind of, I don't know, I, he never mentioned Orville specifically, but I did feel that implication there, that that shows that just do the same thing are not going to survive. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I tried to look up what uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf said about Discovery, and he had this tweet uh, around the time when the showrunners in season two were kicked, well, but while season two was being made, not when it aired, but while it was being made when the showrunners were kicked off the show, uh, he's talked about his own experience in the writer's room and saying how important, this is something I talked about earlier, about how important it is to have writers you can work with and gel, and he said that there was obviously, you can tell that there was strife in the Discovery's writer room, and that probably translated to the screen, and saying that he hopes that they can get that set it settled and have a more congel good working relationship. And he also talked about how Next Generation also had trouble in the writing's room for the first two seasons, which were not good. He didn't say they weren't good, but that's kind of implied, because you know <laughs> they weren't good. And so it seems that he's kind of had the attitude that Discovery could get better once they get the writer's room sorted, and that's what I'm thinking. Of course, I'm implying that he didn't actually say that. Um, I couldn't find anything on Rene, I can't pronounce his last name. Uh, <laughs> uh, he didn't have any, didn't have anything to say about the discovery that I could find. Iris Stephen Barrett seemed to avoid the topic. He was asked about it point blank a lot. And he was just trying, he would always avoid the topic and say they just do their thing. I'm just worried about the space time. So I think he doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, you could infer that he has negative feelings about it, which is why he's avoiding to say anything, because he doesn't want to go on public record being negative about the new Star Trek show. But that's just an assumption. We don't know. So anyway, getting back to the documentary, um, 
Then they have the ending credits uh, where uh, they have this funny scenes with uh, our Stephen Bear and Nana Visitor, which I enjoyed. It's almost the best part of the movie for me. I actually thought that this is, I again, this these scenes in particular, I thought they were shorthanding speaking about two Deep Space Nine fans who would know things like they talked about uh, episodes like Duet and then The Pell Moonlight and The Visitor. I love, and this should have been brought up in the documentary. And I remember Stephen Barrett when he talked about triples, it's like, oh, check the the uh, bonus features for that. And I thought, and he said, oh, it was the same thing within The Pell Moonlight. It was in the documentary, but then it was out. So I thought the bonus features would have a thing about uh, In The Pell Moonlight, but it didn't. Which really disappointed me because I wanted to see the segment about In the Pale Moonlight, but whatever. I saw the segment about the Tribbles, but yeah, Tribble Schmibbles. I've seen segments about that before. I wanted to see the one about In the Pale Moonlight. I think they should have left it in. But I must admit, it was hilarious when she was like, and you can live with that? And he's like, I can live with it. <laughs> like, okay, that was funny. And then, of course, the whole thing when Kira comes back. Oh, you left out the best scene ever. And it's like, oh, roll the best scene. And it's all out of the rain. Like, even though I don't hate that episode as much as a lot of people do, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with it. I still think that's funny. That is a very funny joke. Um, and then we get, of course, we had it before that. We had another stupid lounge singing thing with, you know, four actors this time. But, oh, God, <laughs> don't like it anyway uh before i go let me just very quickly talk about the bonus features that were featured on the dvd uh for those who don't have the dvd or maybe those who do um they have this segment called the brief history of deep space nine where they have this professor in, in a uh you know classroom situation but when you're just looking at him when you turn around to look at his audience this is just jonathan franks there he's like oh let me ask a question and he's basically giving a rundown of Deep Space Nine. Apparently that's how the documentary was supposed to begin. But I understand Bear points out that um, the introduction was way too long because they had the lounge singing and they had the thing with Andrew Robinson. And so they added this in as well. Then it would have been just went on for way too long. I got a good solution for you. Ditch the lounge singing. I'm sorry, but I would have much rather had this brief history thing and then the stupid lounge singing, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> and then you had another bonus feature that I thought was really interesting uh, about the Rocks and Shoals shoot. And I think I've heard about this before, about how it was over 120 degrees or something, and they had the stuntmen dressed as Jim Hadar, you know, in these big, huge, heavy suits, and of course they were fainting and getting heat stroke and stuff because they're out in the desert cheering and this. Uh, and, at the, and the first AD was talking about how that was a very horrific shoot, and I, I thought it was very funny. The stunt coordinator talked about how when the mechs tried to take him out, and it's like, oh, I'm telling the stunt coordinator on you. <laughs> and he's like, I am the stunt coordinator, uh, so that that's kind of fun. And you never, th I you don't get that from watching the episode. And I guess that's kind of the that's the reality of, of TV filmmaking because you know the obvious thing you would be thinking is well just put off the shoot, don't film what's 120 degrees. But when you have the TV episodes and you have to churn them out, and particularly this one, it couldn't be shown. It couldn't be shot in a different order. Uh, because it's this is a serialized storytelling as of, and it's just and it's too much of a production mess to try to move things around order so they had to just go and do it and then they had another segment about sort of the people behind the camera when they talked about production managers and first ADs now I I was a first AD on a short film I don't know if you'd call it I wouldn't call it a professional film but I don't know if you call it an amateur film because it was shown at a couple of film festivals and I do have a listing, not to brag because I'm not, I do have a listing on IMDb as being first AD for this shoot, uh, but I wouldn't consider myself a professional by any means whatsoever. Like I'm definitely not qualified to work as a first AD on an actual show or whatever. It's just an amateur, very low budget short film. In fact, I didn't get paid at all for it. Uh, but I still had that experience 
of being a first AD, so I did find this aspect of the documentary very interesting, and I could relate to it, because the, the film I worked on, the short film I worked on, was a very rough shoot, the director was very disorganized, uh, the, the, the production was all over the place, I had to come in and sort of organize everything and be in charge of these situations, and I was sort of in a similar situation where they had scouted this location, and I didn't bother to like for some reason i didn't bother to check it out to make sure it was okay i just took the director's word for it those words and we got there and it was right by the road right by a busy road and there's like people crossing back and road and it was like a really dangerous situation i was freaking the hell out i was like ah i should have double checked this shit uh, and I, so I can kind of sympathize with the first AD in a shoot like this which, of course, this is way more professional than anything I've been involved with. But still, uh, I could relate to it. And, and then, of course, in the other segment, they talk about the first AD's function of, like, breaking down a, a script. And it's like taking, basically described as taking a cake and sorting it out. Dissecting it, sorting it out, figuring out what all the ingredients are. And rewriting a list of the ingredients and how to bake the cake. And that's basically, and that's something I had to do. It, it is very difficult. <laughs> it's very time consuming uh, and you have to break everything down from scene and technical and location um, it kind of made me nostalgic for doing this and maybe maybe want to do this again but not for free again <laughs> that was just a lot of work anyway um, and then we get another segment with Nog, uh, the actor who played Nog, recounting his first scene, or not his first scene with Cisco, but the scene with Cisco with Avery Brooks, where the, he, Nog, goes to Cisco wanting to join Starfleet, and how he felt this connection with it, and the way that uh, Cisco was like, would, you know, would spit the word for Rangi and try to intimidate Nog and like grab him and like why do you want and that he, he is an actor he felt that connection he's like oh this is amazing Avery Brooks doing such a great job I need to throw it back at him and you see Nog but because I don't want to be like my father like I really identified with that description of acting as well now I also this was totally amateurish. This is just like student plays at community theater, so I'm a complete and utter amateur. I would never consider myself to be an actor by any means. It's definitely just amateurish. Uh, but I did have some experience with with acting, and I did have an experience that's very similar to this, and this he is describing what it feels like to, to have a connection with another actor. For me, it was on stage, of course, in this situation, and in the film situation, but being on stage with another actor and having that connection, feeling that, that energy uh, off of someone else who's doing a really good job and feeling, oh, they're doing such a good job, I need to throw it back, I need to deliver it, and you, you get engaged in it, and you feel this like connection. And so I really enjoyed hearing... Uh, the actor who played Nog re recount that. And it did make me appreciate Avery Brooks as an actor more. I'm still not ready to call him a great actor, but that was a good performance. And I could totally get how, I, you know, I could relate to how uh, the actor who Nog felt uh, was feeling that moment. So that was a really good moment uh, as well. But uh, <laughs> the last thing I will talk about in the, in the bonus features is they also had a deleted scene a couple of deleted scenes actually that showed that there was kind of a rough relationship between Avery Brooks and the actor who played Odo. I will not attempt to pronounce his name. <laughs> um, but it seemed like it didn't seem like it was a long term thing. It, it, they only pointed out like two instances. One was in the pilot episode where apparently, you know, the actor who played Odo says, Oh wait, there's something messed up someone tripped over something and Avery Brooks apparently freaked out and they started yelling at each other and <laughs> and Armin Shimmerin had to interject it's like gentlemen this is my scene <laughs> which is the funny recount but then he had another recount of Far Beyond the Stars when uh Avery Brooks was directing and um apparently he kept telling the actor who played Odo to 
show him anger. He's like not giving him the right kind of anger. And you know, he got very angry at Avery Brooks and started yelling at him. And he's like, that's it. That's the anger I want. He's, and apparently he said, oh, well, you can't have it. This is mine. <laughs> Which I think is funny. And of course, this is recounted by uh, the dude who plays Martok. Uh, so may, that's probably why this wasn't included in the documentary because it's probably one of the cases where they didn't get direct accounts of this event through uh, Avery Brooks and the actor who played Odo. So they uh, they only got a hearsay account of another actor who was there. So that's probably why they didn't include it. But that was still a very uh, funny scene that I appreciated. Anyway, um, I guess I'll give this a rating. I almost didn't, but my rating for uh, what we left behind out of 10 is an 8. Extremely good. It was a very enjoyable documentary. I wouldn't say it's perfect. I was that was expecting a bit more of a narrative. I was expecting a bit more of the deets on Deep Space Nine, but I did think it did a good job thoroughly explaining why the show is meaningful, why it's a meaningful contribution to the Star Trek franchise and, and to science fiction in general and that it should get recognition and it's probably a good thing it is getting a lot more recognition in modern times than it did in the past. So that is it for my review of What We Left Behind. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to check out my channel as I cover many more Star Trek videos at the moment. I'm doing weekly Star Trek episode reviews. I'm also covering Star Trek Enterprise one season at a time. So be sure to check that out. Also check out my channel as I review many more shows like The Expanse, Lost, and more. Uh, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. Thanks a lot for watching.